Welcome to episode 12 of the Tech Bubble, our last for season two. I'm your host, Ian Williamson, and today we have invited staff and students from the Sustainability Council, also known as SUSCO, here at South Island School to discuss the convergence between technology and sustainability. This is Chloe Jazzy Lau, co-host of the Tech Bubble, and I'm delighted to see some synergy finally happening between technology and sustainability and really bringing that out during our discussion discussion today. So we have another very interesting, as always, and well-informed guest list today, and I'm so excited to be discussing such an important aspect of the tech world. Well, we better get started then, Chloe. So first up, it is a great pleasure to welcome Miss Beaumont onto the show. It's a measure of just how bizarre 2020 and 2021 have been, because we actually met in person for the first time only two weeks ago, even though Miss Beaumont joined the school back in August of 2020. I'm sure many of our staff and students would agree that she has made such a massive impact at South Island School that it feels as though she's been on the team for years. Miss Beaumont studied environmental science and geography at university, as well as teaching for many years. She also spent six years out of teaching, running a sustainability catering company here in Hong Kong. Welcome to the show, Laura. And please tell us more about this sustainable catering company. It sounds fascinating. Hi, and thanks for having me on. I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, so yes, as you mentioned, I did have time away from schools and had a bit of time out from teaching. Um, but I still, all the way through that time, those six years, I always first and foremost um, considered myself a teacher. Um, so I've been lucky enough to be teaching ESS and geography for a number of years and have always had a real passion um, to help inspire young people and help them develop awareness of how their own actions um, can impact the world around them. Um, and it's been a real pleasure during that time that I've actually been able to witness uh, many students going on their own personal journeys, um, making their own lifestyle changes in order to be better and more sustainable citizens. Um, and I think that's something that I, I hope we're always doing, that we're continuing to do that as we go through life. I know certainly my own journey and just my own actions and how I live my own life at home has changed over that time um, from you know being very strict in my recycling to starting to compost to looking at the food I eat and it's lovely to see that in the students that I'm teaching too. Um, but as you said I did have that time out of teaching where I ran an events and a catering company and it was actually during that time that I feel um, that I had my own personal ideas kind of change. And I changed and realized that sustainability was not just about our own personal actions, that actually I could have an impact on helping um, develop that kind of thinking, moving away from simply thinking about one's own pers personal actions, but also looking at how we can guide or nudge other people to make changes in their lives. Um, so, for example, in the business, this was kind of quite easy to do at first. There were some real kind of quick fixes or some low-hanging fruit that we could make changes quite easily. Um, so we did things like changing the packaging, filtering our own water, recycling waste, um, starting to make links with or working with local farms. Um, and that was all really great. And that was certainly something that was good for those people who cared about sustainability. They were really happy. But it really sort of made me realize that it was also having an impact on those people who didn't actually care or maybe sort of care about it and aware about it but haven't made any personal actions or personal changes. So this is where it was, became a bit of a light bulb moment for me, where I realized that one of the most powerful types of change that you can make is actually being able to affect the actions of those people who may never actually consciously choose to make more sustainable choices. Um, and I think that's what I'm really excited about for this podcast. So it's like, how do we make sustainable choices a default for people? And, and most interestingly for us here today, how can technology assist us in making that happen. So in making choices that are sustainable, easy for people to make, or simply that they make without having to really go through that thought process. Um, and there are lots of ways that we did that in, in the business, but that's also about what we want to start thinking about in terms of Susco and where that goes in the school. So how can we use technology to make sustainability the default? 
Exciting. And quite a few aspirations there built into the show. I hope we're not going to disappoint you, I have to say. I feel a bit nervous now. Hopefully we'll get there by the end, though. Um, OK, well, thanks for that, Laura. And I'm sure we will have plenty of ideas to share, given the expertise of the guests assembled today. Next up, we're joined by another current teacher, Mr. Adam Tate. So Mr. Tate studied geography at university, followed by an MA in international relations, where he focused a great deal on environmental politics. So Mr. Tate told us that he's always been interested in nature and in the environment, and he actually became a vegetarian at the age of 14 after reading about the environmental impacts of the meat industry on the planet. He's also traveled extensively and is constantly in awe of Mother nature, um, but this has also made him more aware of the environmental issues we face as a society as they're often more visible in developing countries like India. He is passionate about sustainability and he brings that into his everyday life, including composting, bulk buying products, etc., which I'm sure we'll hear about later. Um, and his ultimate goal would be to build a small farm in the future so he can become as self-sufficient as possible. Very interesting. Welcome to the show, Mr. Tate. That farm sounds incredible. I'd love to visit it when you set it up, but tell us more about your vision um, for this sustainable lifestyle. Okay, well, well great. Thanks for, for having me. Um, with regards to the, the farm, I mean, this has been something I've wanted to do for as long as I can remember. Um, but it's a big question, so I don't have the answer to it yet. Um, maybe you guys can help me figure it out. Um, but yeah, the way I see it is life's a bit of an adventure and you know, I'm, I'm happy to see where it goes. I mean, clearly I'm going to need some, uh, clearly I'm gonna need some economic independence. Um, but um, I think people tend to think about, um, you know, sustainability and they tend to forget about some of, um, some of the skills that we might need. And so for, for me, it's been developing those skills, things like being able to figure out how to fix things when they break, being able to compost, being able to garden, being able to you know le learn woodwork skills and things like that so um, I'm quite limited with how much I'm able to develop um, living in Hong Kong but there are definitely ways about it and like with everything so long as we're able to be flexible resilient um, I think independent then you know there's pretty much the sky is the limit so that's just something I've been trying to do um, I've been really pushing hard this year um, also Techno, you know, technologically would benefit greatly from things like YouTube. Um, the amount of things I can go on YouTube and learn, I can follow, you know, really inspiring people, like the Indie Project, and also the podcasts, like How to Save a Planet, um, Outrage and Optimism. There's some fantastic and really inspiring stories out there. So that's just what I'm trying to do at the minute, build my skills, continue that passion for, for nature, and just see where it goes. Sounds like you are in nature. There's some pretty amazing sound effects that I bet people are thinking that we've added these in post-production, but this is just the incredible life that uh, Mr. Tate has over there in Llama. Um, and I have to say, by the way, Adam, that what you've described is very much the approach uh, that my wife and I are hoping to take a bit later on in life. Uh, I love the idea of the, um, of the farm and the sort of sustainable living that you've been talking about there. Um, we, as many listeners of the show will know, have an incredibly crazy boxer dog who sometimes interrupts the podcast from time to time and I'd like a little bit more space for my dog to be in and, and I've been reading and, and following a lot of people on Twitter recently who keep telling me that as much as I like dogs pigs are apparently more intelligent can anyone confirm that for me on the guest list today I'm looking to see if I've got any nods here by the way Obviously, for those of you listening to this as an audio, that's completely lost on you, but I'm not seeing any nods at the moment. That could be a fairly controversial statement. All right, moving on. It gives me great pleasure to announce our next guest. Linda Ng only left South Island School relatively recently, back in 2018. She had a very close affinity to Susco and was also a key member of the Mad Council too, not to mention that she was also our head prefect. Was there anything you didn't do, by the way, Belinda, just looking at that list? Uh, one glance, as I have done at Belinda's LinkedIn profile, tells you that she is still fighting the environmental cause and is a great role model for staff and students alike. She's currently a student at Cambridge University and describes herself as a climate advocate and an aspiring environmental sustainability professional. Kudos to Belinda. Welcome to the show. And um, maybe to start with, tell us how things have been panning out for you since you left South Island School. 
Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, it's really great to be here and chat about these issues. Um, so I'm currently in my final year studying geography, continuing on the trend with the other guests um, in, at the University of Cambridge. So I'm about to graduate this summer. And I think the past yeah, two, three years, it's been very incredible for me to really engage with these issues from a more academic standpoint, but also, um, yeah, be more critical about how we actually think about sustainability and how can we actually go about really making an impact um, beyond just kind of what you might conventionally assume to be kind of advocacy or um, action in that sense. Um, and I think outside of my studies as well, like, I've really tried to take part in various kinds of various sustainability initiatives, um, very much inspired by things that I've learned from my degree. So just a few examples. Um, last summer, I decided to found a sustainability youth-led podcast um, called Sustainapod. Um, we're just wrapping up season one um, next in the next couple of weeks, and we'll be taking a little break to kind of reevaluate and come back in a different way for season two in the summer. So that's been an incredible learning experience. And also with kind of the tech focus of this podcast, um, I've also been really interested in the role of like sustainability and how technology can, sorry, I've also been really in interested in how technology can play a key role in sustainability. And so um, in whilst in my degree, I've been working with some other friends to really develop new interventions through technology such as apps. So um, I was working on uh, developing a web-based app called Cascade that really aims on um, changing decision making um, and making sure that consumers are making more decisions that are focused on sustainability when they do various types of purchase, which also has been a really cool experience. And finally, more in kind of an international level. I've recently been um, selected to be part of the World Ocean State Youth Advisory Council, which has been a really cool experience to work with young people across the world, remotely of course, hence the very key role of technology, um, in really kind of creating some regional and local level um, empowerment and advocacy initiatives in the summer. Wow. You always had such incredible energy whilst wow. you were at school. You, you certainly haven't uh, slowed down very much by the sound of it, Belinda. Um, and by the way, I listened to Sustainapod recently. So a little plug there for Belinda in terms of, of her podcast, which is well worth listening to. The most recent episode actually deals with some issues with regards to journalism um, and environmentalism. So it kind of has a, a bit of an overlap with, with many of the, uh, the kind of tech related points that we're going to be making today. So uh, go for it and have a listen to that. Uh, the viewers of the school. Yeah, just to echo Mr. Williamson, what do you not do, Belinda? Um, but, you know, in um, talking about your app, Cascade, that's interesting because I'm sure you'd be delighted to hear that our first ever CS or computer science cohort actually starts with Mr. Lee in August. Um, and there are three classes in total. I was just telling Mr. Williamson that I wish I could retake GCSE just to do my computer science, but that's aside the point. So um, can you actually tell us a bit more about how the app was developed, for instance, you know, our listeners might be interested in learning about what technical skills or um, other skills that you used in building the app? Yeah, so um, my role wasn't actually the technical role. Um, I was kind of more on the prototyping side of things and like designing what it might actually look like and what the features were. But I did work quite closely over the summer with um, a team of mainly engineers and computer science students who were doing the kind of more technical side of things. Um, and so I would say in terms of the way in which we tried to develop the app, we used like Flutter um, to draw the, um, the different components and really try and code out the actual app. Um, I need to get back to you on the coding language because I haven't, I still haven't found that out yet. Um, it's kind of changed a little bit, um, but I can say from the kind of a perspective of like a non-technical person that's working with these other students that are doing the coding, that the process of forming a web-based app is really not as simple as like, okay, we know how to code, we have an idea, let's go for it. I think we found that there's a huge process of back and forth that comes from, are we coordinating the format? Like the kind of technical understanding isn't just about the coding itself, but also how do you manage the different the, the code base and how like for example we have a user and authentication model that that 
that, that needs to be made and that involves a lot of other more technical kinds of knowledge that isn't just knowing how to code. So I think knowing how that the actual language, but where it sits and how it can be used in different ways is quite important. And I would say for, I guess, listeners that are aren't that don't have this more technical background for me, it was a really good learning experience to try and have at least some kind of baseline understanding of what they were doing. I remember very early on, I'd just be sitting in meetings like, I have no idea what you guys are talking about, but I think that's the, the important part with sustainability is that it is a very multidisciplinary um, topic and it needs people from different backgrounds to understand each other and work together. And so I think for them, like they would then have to kind of learn more about the kind of non-technical side and what what me and my other kind of team members were doing with the more graphic design stuff. And so it's a really, you need to really be embracing of all these different um, subjects and different expertise and see how that works together in a bigger team, which I think was a really good um, learning point for myself personally. Amazing. Yeah, we talked a lot about um, interdisciplinary exploration at, at South Island School, but also specifically at the DLC. So I love how you're harnessing the strengths of different disciplines to really bring this, you know, common goal of sustainability into light. So our penultimate guest is no stranger to South Island School, having been involved in several Making Links events. Listeners, you might um, remember her, um, as well as leading whole school assemblies as a representative of Plastic Free Seas. Tracy returned to Australia at the end of 2017, but now still works completely remotely, of course, due to COVID travel bans, as we're all working now, for uh, Plastic Free Seas. And Tracy is currently undertaking a PhD at the University of Queensland, impressive, researching the biodegradability of biodegradable plastic in a marine environment. So Tracy, I seem to recall that you've been to South Island on several occasions. So have you been um, so far and what are some of your uh, favorite work that you've actually done at South Island School? Um, firstly, thank you so much for having me on the show. It's really exciting um, to, to be involved. Um, I'm great. Um, uh, happy, happy to be in Australia at the moment. Um, but uh, as with most people, um, I'm really miss being on the beaches of Hong Kong. I miss traveling back there, interacting directly with people, um, with students in schools um, and in the community as well. So hopefully one day um, in not too distant future, I'll be back in Hong Kong again. Um, and Plastic Free Seas has certainly had a long standing relationship with South Island School and in particular, uh, the media department. I think one of the earliest um, collaborations was in 2009, and we had um, the first of many students working on projects with us to create videos on the issue of plastic marine pollution. And that was to share with other students for their projects um, and also to share within the school as well. We also had uh, um, students participate in uh, and actually make the um, promo video for our three-day youth conference in 2013, which was fantastic. And we had really great su support from South Island School and uh, most of the other ESF schools as well. Um, and that year, I also gave an assembly talk on plastic microbeads, which are um, tiny fragments of plastic or tiny balls of plastic um, that are used in face scrubs or body care products um, as an exfoliant. And uh, globally, there's, there was a push um, to have these types of plastic removed from these products because it's basically pollution by design. So these plastics just flow through the, the drains and straight out to the sea. So they don't need to be in these products. Um, so we spearheaded the Hong Kong campaign against plastic microbeads. And uh, I gave a, a talk as part of the Making a Difference program to the students. And they took action through letter writing and uh, eventually we did have some success with the microbead campaign. Thankfully, the Hong Kong government um, did put it on the agenda and, uh, um, and now there's a, a voluntary um, ban that's been introduced. Um, we're also super fortunate over the years to have worked with so many fantastic students and, and teachers um, from South Island School. And, and we've seen some really great um, 
big plastic waste reduction actions being taken in the school, in the canteen and in the wider community. So it was really good. So plastic use in our society is so ubiquitous now. It wraps our food, our drinks, even our bodies in synthetic fabrics. And with COVID, we've seen the use of, sin- of single-use plastics and protective shields and coverings and plastic consumption in general um, has increased at an un- unprecedented rate. Governments and companies are always on the lookout for new ways to deal with this waste and technological solutions are increasingly being sought for end-of-life management but also collection of waste. Um, We also need to be mindful of the devil in the details and make sure that um, we're not falling into false solutions or greenwashing traps um, with the introduction of of these new solutions. And I just wanted to add on to um, what Miss Beaumont um, said before. I completely agree about making uh, sustainable products the default and so people don't need to make these choices because um, we're always going to get the people that will make the choices and uh, and the people that uh, don't know about the issue or don't want to do anything about it and I think that's absolutely where we need to be heading making sustainability the the good default option. Amazing. Tracy, on behalf of the entire South Island School community and ESF as a whole, we wanted to thank you so much for everything that you've done and continue to do in this area. Um, So even though you're back in Australia now, I'm sure our school community will continue to benefit your work either directly or indirectly, given our close ties with Plastic Free Seas. So thank you again. Finally, our student guest today is a member of the Sustainability Council. Cameron Keim from 12C1, welcome Cameron. He has been in the council for nearly a year now and to quote, he's told us that the team has offered a glimpse of how of hope that everyone can find an alternative way to the life they live, trying to reverse all the terrible things going on in different parts of the world as a result of human actions. He is very much an advocate for change And he also points to the disturbing images that we see via our news feeds of catastrophic events like heat waves, floods, heavy pollution, etc. Cameron also reminds us that we should all be aware that these things are real. And despite how distant we might see our daily actions from these problems, that we are deeply connected. Some very salient thoughts, Cameron. So welcome again. Tell us a bit more about how you found being part of the Sustainability Council so far. Hi, so Cisco isn't just about worrying about a doomsday scenario to our planet and the Hong Kong environment, but instead I think it advocates a more exciting, sustainable future where we could all be more adaptable to kind of alternative ways of living. And this is like simultaneously helping avoiding going down a path of hitting what Malcolm Gladwell would have referred to as a tipping point and an irreversible decay in our environment and well-being because of our habits over the last few decades. And I also found that Cisco was an an environmental science project. You don't need ecological experts to make the council work. And basically all you need is is just will and passion to direct students and contribute to push the idea of sustainability. And my role in the council involves going back and forth between Cisco and house assemblies or talking to younger students. I worked under the energy pillar, which is one of the three areas the council focuses on along with waste and awareness. And the energy pillar looks at ways of reducing the energy we consume in the schools, such as classroom lights and air conditioning, but also finding alternative energy sources, such as solar panels. And I also use a post on energy saving more, more recently, working under the energy pillar of our plan. And we're also interested in a sustainability podcast, hence why we're on the show with Chloe. So hoping to pick up a few tips and more importantly, how we could relate sustainable ideas to technological use. Wait a minute here, listeners, wait a minute. Our place as the face of the school podcast. Hang on a minute, not even just the school podcast. Don't forget we had Belinda Greer on the show, so we're talking ESF level here. And by the way, everyone, episode eight in which Belinda Greer appeared is available on Anchor, Spotify, and many other podcast platforms, just as a a little reminder. So we're, we're under threat here, Chloe. We're gonna have to pull our socks up, okay? What do you think, Chloe? We are under threat indeed, but nice plug, Mr. Williamson. (laughs) Okay, so moving on from that bombshell, as regular listeners of the show will know, we like to conduct some surveys in advance of podcast episodes. So this time we thought it would be interesting to survey the school, inquiring as to which is our favoured search engine. So more specifically, having set DuckDuckGo 
as my own search engine recently for my iMac, which is what I'm using at the moment, and a Koja for my laptop, I'm very interested to see how far Google's market domination stretches in school. So what have you got for us, Chloe? And by the way, what do you use? Okay, so I have tried pivoting to DuckDuckGo. You know, I've been on and off, but it is so difficult to break out of the Google bubble. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, our student body looks like they're in agreement. So just to, you know, read off some statistics from our survey, Google is in the lead for student usage at South Island School with a whopping 94.2%. Well, DuckDuckGo has um, an 8.6% usage and um, Ecosia has a 5.2, etc. Um, so Mr. Williamson, I know there were a few comments that we asked students to put in as to why they've chosen these specific browsers. So let's hear it. Well, I think most of the comments that I'm reading as I just flick through tend to be about the convenience of using Google, Chloe, uh, which is as you'd expect. I'm reading one here that was it's probably the most accessible and widely used. Plus, it doesn't have the same language barrier problem problems that you know Bing sometimes has. Um, that's repeated several times. Um, but the students who are using DuckDuckGo are talking about it purely from a privacy point of view. So I think you know going back to some of our previous episodes and the discussions that we've been having um, about you know privacy concerns, the use of data, who that's being sold to, um, and the kind of moral issues I guess that relate to those those themes. Uh, perhaps what we're seeing is maybe the tip of an iceberg and perhaps maybe we should try and think about doing that survey again this time next year to see if the, the picture has changed at all. Also, listeners, you might be interested in knowing that Mr. Williamson actually paid for SurveyMonkey just for us to step out of that um, Google Drive bubble because there are some privacy issues with surveillance capitalism. We've been reading this great book, um, but we have been switching up our platforms. So there is, you know, we, we're kind of on the brink of, of a uh, paradigm shift towards more privacy friendly platforms. And so a lot of this just goes back to the awareness, which is what we try to do with this podcast. So back to you, Mr. Williamson. Uh, Mr. Williamson would add to that 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 was a complete mistake that he had to pay for Survey Monkey. Um, he was hoping when he suggested it that it was free um, and has realized now why Google is free, by the way. But anyway, it worked very well and it's actually got some amazing results and data analysis tools. So I'm going to be using it in the future, at least for a while, as part of a pilot. I will report back on, on how I find it. Um, coming back to you, Adam, um, seeing as we're speaking about search engines, um, can, can you perhaps, I mean, from your perspective, can you outline why Ecosia or indeed any other search engine that you might want to mention, why they're more sustainable or ethical for our students to use? Um, I mean, the comments that I just, just presented there, you know, many students would perhaps suggest um, why would I need to stop using Google? Um, should they even stop using Google? I, I think is a, is a wider question. What do you think? Uh, good question. Um, oh, two good questions. Um, so dealing with the first one, so sort of why might we want to switch to something like Ecosia? Um, I've been experimenting around with this for a little while now, just trying to see what other alternatives there are to Google, because sometimes I feel a bit sort of trapped by Google. Um, if we're thinking though about sort of some of the more ethical search engines, there are alternatives. Um, but the reason I wanted to talk about Kosher is that it focuses definitely much more on the environmental aspects. Um, so why would you want to switch to them? Well, there are several reasons really. Um, the first one for me would be that they run on 100% renewable energy. Um, in fact, they're running at about 200%, which means that they're, they're actually um, producing more energy than, than they need, which is great. Um, that's obviously a really sustainable business model. Um, it obviously tackles things like climate change, which I think is probably the most pressing issue of our time. So anything that really goes to sort of mitigating or reducing that, the impacts um, to climate change, I think is a major positive. Um, the other thing is you're also sending a really important message to sort of big TNCs, big companies like Google to change how they produce energy. And I think people forget that as consumers, when we switch to um, other companies with alternative business models, and if enough people do that, that does send a message. And uh, so, you know, that has knock on effects. Secondly, I think really it's about profits as well. So the profits here are used to plant trees. Um, I think people find that a bit hard to understand. But what that means is that they're essentially giving their profits to NGOs around the world um, that do plant trees. 
uh, even where I live on Lama here, um, there's a whole forest up here that never used to be there. And that's NGOs that have planted those trees. Without those NGOs, that might not be here. Now, clearly NGOs don't have the money, say these big companies have. So it's really important that, you know, we support them if we can or in any way that we can. Um, trees are really vital to so much of the planet. Uh, firstly, natural carbon sinks. So they store carbon dioxide. Um, and it's better to have it stored here than stored in the atmosphere. They regulate, uh, regulate moisture, uh, which is key to so much of the water cycle. Um, they prevent, prevent things like desertification and soil erosion, which is increasingly becoming problematic. Uh, and of course, it creates rich, they create rich uh, and biodiverse natural habitats for other fauna and flora. I think planting trees and also coupled with their dedication to using renewable energy, um, which essentially equates to about one kilogram of CO2 being removed from the atmosphere for every search you do. Um, when you think about how many searches you do a day, you're probably not even aware of how many you're doing, but that's going to really be quite an incredible and empowering statistic. Um, coming back to your second question, so whether we should stop using Google, I don't think that's a good question. I think the thing, the way I would like to, to, to think about this is how we frame things though. Um, so I'd like to frame things more, especially with anything environmental in a sort of positive light. Um, I think one, one of the obstacles that environmentalism has struggled with in the past is perhaps um, being seen, seen as sort of negative or a, you know, a guilt trip. And I think we need to sort of get away from that. So the way I like to think about it, it's not really about what are we losing out? What, you, know, what, uh, you know, why are we not using Google? It's more on, well, what are we, po what, what positive impact are we having? Um, so just remember that I think making just these small change, which is changing basically just a search engine can actually help protect the, you know, the earth, which we can't really live without. You know, it gives us the air we breathe, the water we drink and the food that we eat. Um, I think those things should be celebrated um, as that sort of is part of what makes us empowered and ethical global citizens. Um, you know, no one's saying here, stop using Google. Obviously it's an integral part of, of, of school. Um, we couldn't really use it at, at this stage anyway. We couldn't live without it. Um, but we could, you know, switch how we, uh, just our search engines to something like Akosha. Um, I think there are also things to think about beyond just the environmental impact here, um, such as accountability of companies, you know, such as Google, um, something like Ecosia, which is a, a quite a small not-for-profit sort of B-Lab company. Um, they might hold themselves to, you could argue, sort, sort of more accountable, more ethical standards, which Google maybe has, you know, come into conflict with, particularly when we're thinking about privacy, privacy data, taxes, um, and things like that. I think ultimately for me, it's about being a conscientious consumer of things. That includes media, how we use the internet. And I, I think, you know, considering those are, are really important in this day and age. I think that's some really good points there that you've made. And, and, and really, I suppose in many ways, what you're suggesting is, you know, you don't have to use Google all the time, for instance. I mean, what I've found is there are times when I'm not getting the results that I want. And I, I don't think that anyone would suggest that alternative search engines have the kind of scope which Google has. But we don't need to make every single search using Google. And as you said, it brings pressure to bear on the big tech giants when um, their share of, of, of market use is falling. And uh, perhaps um, ask questions about investigating why it is that people are moving away and, and, and what points that they're making there. Yeah, that, that's interesting, actually. On the note of big tech, um, I was doing a bit of digging on Ecosia, and I found that it actually rela relies on uh, Microsoft Bing. So um, Ecosia doesn't actually generate their own web results. They have a partnership with Bing. Um, and this is not a big deal. This is not new news. You know, Yahoo does that. DuckDuckGo does that. Um, but, you know, Bing has had a slew of monopolistic tendencies, privacy problems, targeted ads against search results with their search engine. Um, so I was wondering, just, just from your viewpoint, Mr. Tate, what impact do you think this connection with Bing or uh, Microsoft Big Tech, we'd call it, um, has on the ethical nature of Ecosia? I mean, that is probably, you know, it is problematic. Um, however, and I'm sure this is something they're aware of, um, but a small company like that just don't have the resources, I assume, that someone like Google and Bing do. So they're sort of, 
you know, it's, it's, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. So I think, you know, um, they're probably doing the best that they can without alienating people completely because they need their engine essentially to work. Um, but, you know, again, if we sw more people switch to it, they have potentially more money for investment and then can become increasingly more independent from those kind of big tech companies. So, yeah, I think mean, that's something to consider. But let's not forget, everyone, that, you know, Google became powerful because of our searches. You know, it was the, 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 the use of us. We created Google in many ways. Um, and I guess we, we want to try and create some alternatives which um, can ultimately become independent in their own ability to leverage the, 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 um, the algorithms that come from the searches that we're entering in there. So an interesting discussion, maybe one that we'll come back to in a future episode. I, I find this one fascinating, by the way. Um, uh, yeah, actually, quick note on that. Um, I do think Ecosia has a very scalable business model just because of its nature as a nonprofit and also kind of a budding social enterprise as well um, if it develops its model further. So I do think there's a lot of potential in Ecosia as a search engine. And I think, you know, we shouldn't completely discount the, the search engine just because of its links, as you have said. It just allows them to scale more as a sm small nonprofit. So definitely more conversation about that later. Um, but Belinda, Moving on to you, uh, from your interaction with students at Cambridge, um, how does this compare with the approach to sustainability and tech taken by the current generation of uni students? Obviously, you know that well, um, given your contacts on this guest list. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, sure. I think I'll just start by framing kind of the bigger um, engagement with sustainability within, I guess, academia and policymaking, because I think that really kind of filters down to, I guess, what students are doing and how students interact with these kind of bigger discourses. I think here in the UK, um, at least in the past few years, like decarbonization has been really big on the agenda. And especially with the COP26 climate conference coming up at the end of this year, which the UK is actually hosting, I think this discussion is only going to become even more prominent. And Oftentimes, I think there has been this huge framing of kind of technology as being a key silver bullet in a way like, you know, if we just adopt these technologies, the climate issue is going to be almost like resolved. We can kind of continue to perpetuate individual kind of consumption behaviors um, the way that it always was before, but just in a more sustainable way. And I think um, even within academia, there's been kind of the encouragement for a more critical view on this. So who, for example, is in charge of making these decisions and how does it have very unequal impacts across the world in many different, for many different communities. Um, and I think with this kind of powerful discourse of almost like very like a modernist kind of intervention with technology, um, from a kind of student level, there has been this decarbonization discourse is definitely filtered down in, in the work that students are doing. So um, I think in that sense, students have been really key drivers for using technology for kind of making intervention and in individual actions, more or less, but more along the lines of decarbonization as well. So, for example, um, students have used the idea of apps to make that first step in altering behavior change. Um, the principle behind Cascade, which I mentioned earlier, um, and a web-based app that I've been working on with some other students at university, is that it is drawing on the idea of providing information in very digestible and easy to understand ways, which often gets lost in the kind of, if you're trying to understand like what policymakers are what policymakers are doing, but also what academics are doing, um, but also creating new forms of more innovative ways to engage with the material digitally. Um, I think these are two very key things that that make apps quite distinct and how they can create certain interventions for individuals to make them better understand themselves as part of bigger networks and communities that are trying to do things. And so there is a kind of key scalar component to that as well that students are really trying to leverage on virtually through developing an app. And I think here the technology has a key role in making sustainability something fun that people want to do and really making it a communal thing, but also bringing in the strong educational component of it as well. With all of this being said, I think working on the app has also taught me that behind all the technology is a very human centric approach. Um, I think we, when we were making the app, we also had to think about, you know, why would people want to use this and how do people actually interact with these different components that we're trying to bring out. It's not just about making technology the kind of blanket solution and 
like imposing it on everyone to use and hoping that that's going to change their behavior. There's a lot of personal human based factors that we also have to consider. And I think um, so it really can help convert mindsets and realize our small actions can make a difference. But the choice to use these and how is ultimately, as I mentioned, like quite a human approach. Thanks, Valinda. You just gave me the perfect segue to my next question, actually. Um, and you mentioned kind of a, a shifting from, you know, a, a shifting trend of technology into a more human centric approach. And I think in recent days, we've actually seen that with policy, too. So on your point on environmental policy, um, what do you think about the future of environmental policy, given that there have been policy fields cropping up like behavioral economics with, um, I think it was the UK Behavioral Insights team talking about, you know, nudging consumers to uh, purchase more green packaging, nudging consumers to use less plastic products in um, not so much a draconian policy legislation way, but in very subtle ways that, you know, obviously has has problems with infringing on rights, but also is kind of a, a more refreshed approach to um, policy. And I think this also adapts to our very technologically shifting world. So what do you make of the future of environmental policy, given your um, knowledge in this field? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think I guess I'll maybe talk about it more from a general view, because I, I think I know that policy obviously varies across different contexts. I think the Hong Kong landscape with like environmental policy is definitely very different, um, and, but it is very, moving very forward as based on what I've been following on. Um, I think more generally, the idea, as you mentioned, like policy not being just about like legislation and like draconian like regulation is very is going to become increasingly important, because I think at least from what I can see, the policy circle is understanding that it's not just about like top down, um, at least here in the UK, I think there's, it's not a top down kind of model of imposing like knowledge on people. I think they've been increasingly trying to understand that, you know, citizens need to understand this in a way that is framed for them. And there's a need to kind of incorporate more of the science in a way that isn't just blanketly, as, as I mentioned, like just disseminated out, but see it as a more of an interactive network of different stakeholders and trying to make sure that other stakeholders understand your unique kind of contribution. So I think from, I think firstly with, yeah, regulations and all that, that's definitely much, very much needed. In fact, I think to bring in another topic, maybe more from like what businesses are doing, for example, with ESG, um, the role of the policy circle has been very key for that in the UK. Now, with that being said, I think from a, in another topic, for example, like um, with climate action, there is an increasing role for policy to assimilate science in a way and communicate that to citizens in a, in a format that is understandable, because I think that's a huge part of making everyone join the journey together towards a more sustainable future. And I think if there isn't more multidisciplinary understanding across different stakeholders, which I think the policy network is really trying to do, then it's going to be very difficult to achieve. So I brought in like a lot of things there. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's awesome. Such a rich discussion. Once again, you know, a lot of these conversations we'd love to follow up on on a future episode. But just to reel you in here, Cameron, um, you know, just given that Belinda has spoken about policy change and making a difference in a university landscape, I'd love to better understand, given your knowledge of Sustainability Council, what the high school environmental activism landscape looks like. So what has... Um, you know, what does the future of Sustainability Council look like to you? And how do you think you can harness some of that development with the rise of technology? I think despite how much right now, where I kind of admiring the evolution of technology, as we always have been like, whether it's industrial revolution or like hundreds of years ago, it's definitely come in very handy in using a way that would use less people. So say that you had a group of people in the room, not many of them want to support you in the idea of sustainability. So you invent something where they can't really argue against it and it just implements this mitigation right away. So e even if they disagree, it's, it's still gonna like help sustain. And um, I think the other factor that comes in with technology is the support of younger people. So even though you have technology, you need people to kind of support, you need support. Like even though 
not not many people would agree with you and you have that piece of technology to like as a mitigation strategy i still don't think it would work well because as we have like social media we have um advertising you can't really promote it it, it can be one piece of like it, it can be something that counters heat waves and, and it could just sit in a room but it won't do anything unless people actually like make it part of their awareness campaigns and i think it's not just technology on its own that does the job it's more like a combination of different factors we could use with the idea of sustainability well we're going to be coming back to that cameron later on i'm going to try and find out from all of you what your um your take is really on social media use as well and and, and whether you feel it's actually uh, genuinely uh, having an impact out there. We'll come back to that one later on, though. Um, I'm just going to um, change the focus for a second. Tracy, I, I, I just noticed actually that your colleague, Dana, um, Dana Winograd, who has also been in South Island School many times, uh, you know, doing plastic free sea stuff as well, uh, a fellow um, citizen out there in Discovery Bay with me. And she was on Belinda's podcast on um, episode one. In fact, I think it was your, your first guest, Belinda. Was that right? Yeah, that's true. Um, actually, we're at the team, like St. Paul, we're super grateful for Dana's support because um, at that point it was still a very experimental idea and she was just so on board whilst we were trying to figure out the, the whole like process of being host and organizing that. Um, so she was very patient with us and we're really grateful for that support that really helped to launch the whole thing. Yeah. I think she was basically telling me in an email the other day in the nicest possible way, she was telling me off for not having come down to Hemingway's enough on a, on a Sunday morning that there's a new initiative in Plastic Free Seas that's going on at the moment. So if Dana's listening to this, I'm, coming, I'm going to come down one Sunday soon, OK, honestly. So speaking of Plastic Free Seas, our researchers here at the Digital Leadership Council noticed from scratch, scanning through the Plastic Free Seas website, which is looking very cool, by the way, Tracy, that you currently have an intriguing initiative entitled and obviously as digital people, we picked up on this, the Artificial Intelligence Project in partnership with Clearbot, which sounded quite interesting too. Can you tell us a little bit more about that one? So this is uh, one of our, I guess, uh, current partnerships, but we're really excited uh, about this. We think it's got great, uh, great potential. And it is a new Hong Kong startup called Clearbot, um, a project developed by Hong Kong University students who are building the world's first fully open source artificial intelligence or AI model and data set for trash detection and collection, which is actually a bit of a mouthful sounding. Um, but uh, basically their end goal is to have solar powered automated robot boats moving through waterways like a small swarm of trash collecting vessels and they'll be able to distinguish um, floating rubbish from marine life, from natural debris as well. So um, making cleanups a lot uh, more efficient, cost effective and uh, just be able to happen um, 24-7. And uh, so they're still in the um, still in the first phase, which is what Plastic Free Seas is fully supporting and helping to drive uh, um, through schools as CAS projects or something similar. Um, basically, we need uh, um, a lot of photographs. Um, so each, each item, each plastic item, like a bottle cap or a fork, needs to have um, between two and 3,000 photographs um, so that they can develop the, the AI um, data set. And obviously this is going to take a lot of input from people, from volunteers, um, to build this initial database. Um, but one of, the, one of the great things, and it uh, just made me think when Belinda was speaking about the human-centric element as well, um, to develop this app, obviously it takes a lot of human input as well. And uh, one of the things that we always found when getting people down to beach cleanups was that real connection was made when people were handling the rubbish. When you're picking up, you know, 500 plastic straws or whatever it is from a beach, um, you realize that, okay, next time you go to drink with a plastic straw, those connections are made and you're going to refuse that. And, and I think we're going to see that with the, um, with the photographs with the app as well when you're taking um, hundreds of photographs of particular types of um, 
of rubbish and then uploading them to the Clearbot website, you're going to be making those connections as well. So this is really great because we get a lot of people that don't want to get their hands dirty on a beach cleanup, and that's understandable, um, although we do obviously wear um, washable gloves. But um, for some people, that's just not their thing. And I think being able to contribute to this project and make a real impact for the future without um, without picking up rubbish, literally, I think will make a, um, a big impression on a lot of people that we wouldn't normally connect with. So I'm really excited about... Um, about that uh, point of view as well. Um, so although we've had plastic marine pollution as a global issue now for at least 30 years, there's still a lot we don't know about how plastic interacts with the environment, what happens when it degrades, how long will it be around for in different environments, in the sea, in the sand, um, in the vegetation, um, everywhere. So. Um, and also the toxicity of plastic um, and, and how much is actually out there. So there's still a lot of focus and a lot of effort needs to be on clean up now. Um, and certainly with the, um, technological solutions we need for this. But we also need to make, obviously, waste reduction a priority. Um, and uh, especially the avoidable and unnecessary single-use plastics that we use for food and beverage packaging. Um, and actually surprisingly more than a third of plastic made each year is actually used just for food and beverage and packaging and for the packaging of the, all the products that we buy as well so making switches in reduction of waste in this in this area and reducing our packaging um, really does make a, really, a big difference in in the amount of waste um, that uh, that we can reduce just with our personal actions um, so I just did, one of the reasons I started a PhD this year at, um, at UQ was uh, I wanted to understand how biodegradable plastics actually biodegrade in the marine environment. Um, and uh, one of the reasons that this whole area um, is really important in, in the biodegradable plastic sphere is that um, these, uh, these types of plastics and compostable plastics are being touted as a solution for fossil fuel plastics. And, uh, and we really don't know a lot about them still. So making sure that, uh, that we understand uh, um, how they act is a great way to reducing greenwash and the myths and the misconceptions um, associated with these products. Um, plastic, even compostable biodegradable plastic, never disappears instantly like we sort of think it does um, when, you, when you throw it away or, or put it in the recycling bin or something. Um, that's the sort of idea that people have, that it's gone. Um, and certainly the end-of-life environment for that plastic, be it the landfill or litter on the beach or in the sea, that will influence the time frame of biodegradation and, and the interaction with the environment, whether that's with animals or marine life. Um, so some bioplastic that's compostable on land in an industrial composter is not biodegradable in any reasonable length of time in the sea. So we really need good scientific research to understand um, what the implications are for using this type of plastic. Um, we need to be able to implement real and pla practical solutions for most of the, uh, or for the most effective and appropriate plastic products um, that we're going to use and make sure that we develop good policy and legislation for managing this waste. Otherwise, we're just swapping one pro problem um, for another. It doesn't really help in the long run. Great insights. Thank you so much, Tracy. This sounds like a very exciting project, and I'm sure we'll hear so much more about it in the future years to come. So, Ms. Beaumont, um, just to reel you in here as well, um, just listening to Tracy discuss the way in which tech is being leveraged by plastic-free seas, obviously very exciting times. Can you tell us a little bit about the way we, as a school in South Island's context, are using tech within a sustainability context? And furthermore, where would you like to see this partnership mature and grow in the coming years? So, for example, I know you have a background in catering, so do you see this as potentially having an impact on, on our school canteen that is now closed, by the way, but still future developments? Um, yeah, well, uh, certainly. Obviously, at present, um, with those things that are in place and restrictions that are in place, um, our 
things that we have been doing in Susco have also had a, that's had a knock-on impact on things that we've been doing in, in the Sustainability Council. So at the moment, I would say that the use of technology really has been as a platform, and we've kind of had some discussions around that already during this session about how we can use that as a platform to reach people, to highlight and to raise awareness about sustainability in general. Um, so a couple of things that we've got going on in the background is a new Instagram page and also a, a Susco website that's being sort of worked on behind the scenes. Um, but for next year, we really want our council to focus on, on making some of those institutional changes around the school, um, really to look at and make our organisation more sustainable um, by adding some of those defaults that we were talking about and that maybe I was mentioning earlier. And the canteen is actually a really great example of that. Um, so I know, and now I'm thinking, as I've been listening and this podcast is going on, I'm actually thinking that Tracy probably had a big impact and was involved in this. But I know that we've had a number of sort of awareness drives and actions and campaigns to actually make our canteen more sustainable. So I know we had a focus of an awareness on reducing food waste and also a successful campaign to stop the use of plastic cutlery, which I'm feeling now that <laughs> Plastic free seeds might have been involved in, or <laughs> sounds like it could have been. Um, and, and that was that idea, wasn't it? That idea of kind of bringing your own cutlery has become that default option, or it appears to be. I've never actually been at the school while the canteen's been open, but that's certainly what I've, I've been led to believe. Um, but we know that food like, is a huge or a key area for having a major impact on the environment. I think it, it's really common knowledge now that what we eat, or in terms of um, how it's farmed, where it comes from, how it's packaged, what we throw away, is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and, and, and to that um, idea of climate change and the, the problem of climate change. So that awareness has really grown and, and social media and apps and technology has helped that, um, that idea grow through movements like Green Monday. Um, ideas such as flexitarianism, those have come from a lot of social media and from different apps and technology um, highlighting that as a, as a potential solution or certainly not a solution, but something that can sort of help mitigate some of those problems. Um, but technology has really pushed those forward. And one of the, or a lot of companies now have become known for having sustainability focus as their mission. And one of those I became interested in, and, and Tracy was just talking then about waste and cutting down and reducing waste. Obviously, as, a, as, as working in events and catering, that was the first and most obvious thing I wanted to do. And I did look at that. We looked at changing to compostable. But again, there's huge elements of that. Where does compostable packaging actually go? Can it be composted in Hong Kong, uh, right? Which it wasn't able to for a long time. Um, so these companies now, tech companies, have moved in and helped us move past those initial kind of quick fixes or, or changes that we can make. Um, one of those I became interested in through catering after we did these quick fixes was the introduction of a company known as, uh, most people probably know now as Impossible Beef. Um, and their mission is to drastically reduce humanity's destructive impact on the global environment by completely replacing the use of animals as food production technology. And so now I'm really interested in this idea, or certainly of the council having a look at a key issue Issue, a key environmental problem, um, something that adds to an environmental problem, our canteen, and we've looked at some of the areas around that, but how could we make sort of some real change? How could we now start to look at some of these companies that have used technology to replace meat, for example, which is what Impossible Beef has done, which is basically to make a product that looks like raw meat and, and behaves and acts in a way that looks like a real burger, but is actually made from plants uh, such as pea protein, coconut and potato. So therefore drastically decreasing a lot of the emissions that are created by farming on such a large scale and, and farming of cattle especially. Um, so for me and for the Sustainability Council, that's what we want to move towards. So this idea, so of course we use social media as awareness raising and, and a, a drive to make people more aware and people more on board, but then how can we make certain changes? So would it be possible for us to approach 
is it Chartwells, I think, who provide the catering when the, when the canteen is back open, would it be able, would we be able to approach them? Could they start to use some of these products? Because it's now not just impossible beef, but we've now got um, things like plant-based pork, plant-based chicken. Could we not be involved in having a Green Monday? Could we not be offering or nudging people to this point where we're providing that alternative, where that alternative is becoming... Um, the default. Some of the things that we've already talked about is this idea. We certainly, I know um, Adam mentioned it when we we're talking about uh, platforms like, can we tell people what to do? Can we enforce change? Can we tell people that they have to eat this plant based meat as an alternative? Well, I don't think so. Personally, at the moment, I don't think we can necessarily do that. But then social media could be a key in getting that message across and also hopefully getting those stakeholders actually on board. Um, I know that there was an issue that, you know, the council themselves have talked about when we introduced the bring your own cutlery and, and stop the plastic cutlery, that there was a kickback from students on that and that it wasn't necessarily something that was easy to drive through. So I think we've got technology which is supporting these changes and allowing us to live in a more sustainable way and then that social media can help us certainly get that word out and help, sort of help us to try to educate and sort of convince people and if not if we're not convincing people and we're not educating or people aren't passionate or, or want to make that change themselves then how can we simply make it a default for people to choose that as their easy option. I think it's a it's a testament, isn't it, of how much has changed. When I was just listening there to to first Tracy talking, and then yourself, Laura, uh, uh, just how much things have changed in such a short period of time. I mean, um, we were just not having these conversations ten years ago. Um, sometimes it can be a bit depressing, kind of like you you feel as though you're not moving forward with these issues. But it's it's listening to people like yourselves there um, that makes me feel actually we've come a very very long way that we're even having those kind of conversations, and the fact that. Um, those alternatives to meat-based products. As somebody who you know is a, a vegetarian for many, many years, still a pescatarian now. Um, you know the, the the choice that's available now for young people who are making that decision, and many of them are. It was it suddenly struck me as we were um, talking there that maybe one of the surveys we should put out using my paid Survey Monkey account, so we can get some actual use out of it, would be to find out how many what you know what students. Um, you know, food choices are in school now. Like what percentage of our, our student population are vegetarian, pescatarian, etc. That would be very interesting. Um, many of our regular listeners will know that we like to ask the same question to all of our guests, at least once during the show. So um, to finish off today, um, I wanted to follow up by one of the points which uh, Miss Beaumont made about social media. So how do the rest of you view the impact of environmental causes as part of social media as a whole? Um, so I'm thinking here about you know the likes of Greta Thunberg and Naomi Klein and other big sort of celebrity names. Are they making a quantifiable difference in in your opinion? So I'm gonna I'm gonna be strict here with you all. You're gonna get one minute each um, before I do the outros today. So um, Tracy, let's go to you first, and then we'll give everybody their their moment in the sun. Yes, um, social media absolutely is a great tool um, for our messages of plastic marine pollution um and action to get shared and uh, and for people to be inspired as well um it's a great way to reach new parts of the community that we wouldn't normally get um particularly i guess also with platforms like tiktok and and things like that um i remember a few years back um there was a a, a really incredible effect of just one photograph um, shared of an esf student actually whilst he was waiting for the ferry um, home to discovery bay he just started picking up all the plastic cups that had been left behind at the bar by all the adults um, from the night before. Um, and somebody took a snap and put it on social media and said, what a fantastic um, student this was. The image went viral and sparked a huge amount of discussion online, mainly about adults littering, um, but also how fabulous this kid was for taking action. Okay, so the way I look at social media is like, it's almost like a flare gun where you kind of fire it up and it instantly disperses brief information on any kind of, kind of environmental information. And like social media is like the seeds for any kind of trend. So it could be fashion or video games. And this applies exactly the same to environmental issues. So like about 10 years ago, um, my mom used to buy kind of groceries 
because with um we use plastic bags and people used to find that weird but now it's just like a really common thing that happens every time you go to the supermarket like welcome they or, or they always like make you pay if you ask for a plastic bag so um it's a trend and social media has helped this with like alternative sustainable innovations or just anything like only pork uh, related to the environment in general and although i try to spend less time on social media these days it is still a path that people can use just to gain some basic understanding on the environment they don't always have to like be a hundred percent trustworthy um they won't turn you into experts just by reading it but at least you gain like foundation understanding and so even this podcast like i think when it gets out to the rest of the students in, in, in sis um and then when they listen to it it's just like a really fast way of just they just get basic knowledge you don't have to take any lessons but it's quick accessible and enjoyable for them that's a good point cameron it reminds me chloe of your uh, audio books that you listen to yeah it's quick and accessible it's chloe's way of learning at pace by the way everybody um good points there every week i have to traipse my way over to marks and spencers with the same four reusable bags um, I almost kind of see that every week as sort of like this, you know, like as I'm, I'm sort of making my way through the city with these four bags on my shoulders. But I think about once upon a time, how many plastic bags would you have got through during that time? You know, an absolutely crazy amount. And yet uh, it's that default position that you were talking about earlier on, Laura. Yeah, that we, we kind of all do this now. It's almost when you see people um, needing plastic bags and things, you're quite shocked by it. You, you expect people to be, to be taking those reusable bags. Thanks, Cameron. Um, Adam, what about you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I do think that social media has a, <clears throat> an impact and a positive impact. Is it quantifiable? I think that's difficult to answer with any social movement. But I do think if you look at, particularly with young people, I think how they think and feel about these issues that, and some of the passion, in fact, that we see behind sort of the environmental movement, then social media certainly must be having a positive impact. I think despite that, uh, it's important that we don't become complacent because I think also we have to like, recognize that social media can also you know, provide a platform for anti-science and anti-climate change misinformation. And I think that can obviously be clearly very dangerous. So I think you know, we just have to be conscientious or aware of that as well. Sounds like the wind's getting up over there in Llama, Adam. Uh, yeah, it's getting a bit windy. Lovely. Um, Laura? Yes, I mean, really already kind of what I've said in and, and this fact, I wanted to pick up on something that Adam had said earlier about this idea of sort of framing environmentalism in a positive light. And I think social media has really allowed that to take place. Yeah, that potentially previously there was a bit of a, a negative association or a kind of an idea that you had to be slightly alternative to be bothered about the environment and I think this has now just become far more mainstream in that our ideas of being passionate and of this being something that is respons uh, the responsibility of all of us and I think that's the reach of social media has allowed that to happen. Thanks for that Laura. Uh, Belinda, your minute. Yeah I fully agree with what the other guests have all said. I think social media has been very powerful for mobilizing young people to communicate environmental issues. And I just wanna add that on this point, it's the agency that they now have to realize that I can think about these issues critically. I can engage and think about how they intersect with each other. So for example, um, a very prominent kind of high school led, high school student led youth movement online called Reearth is really thinking about currently creating content that is looking at the intersectionality of climate change and how it intersects with other aspects in society. And so for the youth that are engaged, it's very empowering to, for them to think about how can I be an agent in this sense and communicate these issues. And I think that is something that is going to be very big in the coming few years and onwards as we move towards a more sustainable future. Thank you very much, Belinda. Um, that seems like a lovely note to, to leave it, actually. Um, that is all we've got time for today. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Miss Beaumont, Mr. Tate, uh, Belinda, Tracy and Cameron for their excellent contributions, as well as my co-host, uh, Chloe Jazzy Lau. We're going to be back soon with our third season. I don't know what we're actually going to do yet, by the way, but I'm sure we'll have figured that out quite soon. Um, so that will start after the Easter vacation with some more tech related content. Um, we want to encourage you all to stay safe wherever you're listening to the show and have a great Easter holiday when it comes. In the meantime, as ever, we'd love to hear your thoughts on the show. What would you like us to discuss? 
If you've got any ideas, questions or feedback, then please write to digileaders at webmail.sis.edu.hk. That's digileaders, spelled D-I-G-I, at webmail.sis.edu.hk. As always, thanks for listening.